It's a landmark day in India today with the rollout of Corbevax, a made-in-India vaccine for children between the age of 12 and 14. Corbevax, which is priced at 145 rupees plus taxes to the government, is perhaps the cheapest COVID vaccine in the world. Biological E is headed by one of India's most remarkable business leaders, Mahima Datla, the MD of the company. At 44, she heads a company which has probably inoculated one in every two babies in India. Now, Biological E is the first private sector biological products company in India. It represents really some of the finest in Indian pharma, where we are clearly world leaders, certainly in manufacture. Mahima Datla joins us now. Thanks, Mahima, very much uh, for being with us. It is very much a, a landmark day. Uh, we've been trying to speak now for the better part of one year, but I think you've been waiting for all this time, perhaps for this day. Um, what is this day the culmination of for yourself and for your company? Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak with you. And I must say, we've always sort of believed our actions uh, should speak louder than our words. So I apologize that it's taken us so long to come on air and speak with you. Of course, this day has been an extremely emotional one uh, for myself, our entire team, because we've had such a history of supplying pediatric vaccines and to finally join this fight against COVID uh, to help our country and that to it being deployed for children down to the age of 12 uh, has been an overwhelming feeling. Um, and we're just, you know, humbled to, to be part of the solution. Um Give us an idea of the, the battle or the challenge that you faced in scaling up. Because what you uh, all along have said and what BioE stands for is that you're, you, aren't, you didn't want to be the first out with a vaccine if you didn't have it in numbers. But that in itself is problematic because to scale up is not easy. Tell us how difficult scaling up was. Sure. So there were three considerations for us. One more. I'm sorry, I'm, Go ahead. am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah. So there were three considerations, really. The first one was obviously that we get a vaccine that works. Uh, the second one was really safety. So we wanted to use a tried and tested technology because we wanted to make sure we're not introducing more variables into a vaccine when the, uh, when the virus itself provides us with enough challenges. And the third was affordability. And this point is directly related to scale. If we aren't able to scale the vaccines, um, vaccines involve a huge amount of fixed costs. The nature of the business is such that you have to invest in, you know, whether it's a facility or trained manpower or power, all of it, majority of it is fixed cost. So if you can imagine if you're allocating those fixed costs to fewer number of doses, obviously right. the cost of the product is very high. So we've always made product in upwards of 100 million doses, keeping in mind the birth cohort, not just of our country, but to the markets we service. Uh, so we've always thought about, you know, capacity in terms of scale, but never before have we been challenged to think about scale as 10 times more than what we've ever done in the past. Right. Uh, but that really meant because we needed to keep affordability at the center of this, um, because I've been in numerous occasions where, you know, country governments and health budgets are stressed uh, with, the, with resources and creating the fiscal space given the large number of priorities before them. So we felt it was our responsibility to make this as affordable. Uh, so we chose a technology that was really scalable. We make hepatitis B vaccines using the same technology. Uh, so we were able to really demonstrate scale and what that allowed us to do uh, was lower the uh, the cost of the cost of so the Mahima, vaccine. just so that I understand it, it's 145 rupees to the government, and with taxes, how much uh, does it come to? Uh, with taxes, maybe about 10 rupees more, but in the private market, I I can tell you the breakup. It's uh, 800 rupees uh, that we would be supplying, and then if you add the excise duty and then the administration cost, the total would come to about 990. Now, and in the case of what you're providing to the government of India, it's the cheapest vaccine in the world, right? COVID vaccine? I like to use the word most affordable. The most cost uh, effective. Correct. Correct. That's absolutely right. And uh, just by our supplies, just through our supplies of 30 crore doses, we'll be saving the exchequer close to 1500 crores. 
And when you do export it, have you decided on, on, on the price at which you're going to export it? Uh, we haven't determined the final price. Uh, it will be a little bit higher than the government because we were very clear that, you know, we wanted the Indian government to have uh, the best possible price. It would be slightly higher, but I, I think much lower than some of uh, some of the vaccines that they're currently using. The price really will be determined based on three things. One is the volume, because we really can't, given the scale we've invested in, it'll be really challenging for us to respond to small volumes with right. the best. I think the second will be really the terms as well, because you know we really need to secure supplies in advance for uh, for you know, uh, the kind of scale that we're producing. So if, if our deal structures entail, uh, you know, favorable terms, then that will play into the price as well. Sure. Uh, so, so, but we would attempt to make it the most affordable because the we want affordable. this to be sustainable for countries to continue immunizing their people. Uh, how effective is it against Omicron? So it's a very difficult question to answer. As you know, our head-to-head -head comparison we had done with COVID Shield, uh, and this was during the Delta wave. So the extensive evaluation we've done against the original ancestral strain as well as the Delta strain, Omicron really became an issue after we completed the clinical trials. Yeah. And then it took a good four to five weeks, even from uh, even for academic institutes to come up with the right construct, the pseudoviruses that you can challenge with the new strains. So we have some very preliminary data uh, that suggests our vaccine behaves uh, behaves in a fashion that confers some cross protection because we had actually tested it even against the beta variant, which was sort of in between. Uh, so, uh, what does the preliminary data show, Mahima? How effective percentage wise against Omicron? Well, it's hard to determine percentages because it wasn't a statistical model and we don't have sufficient data to uh, corroborate anything in terms of percentages. Like, I can tell you it was close to 90% for the original strain, 80% for Delta, but we don't have the statistical models to suggest this. But what I can tell you is, um, is that, of course, there's a, there is a drop in antibody titers, but at naive subjects that weren't exposed to the virus, we saw very high immune response. This was for 30 odd subjects. So bear in mind, this is kind of post, uh, post talk you know, analysis, uh, but as and when data becomes available, we will present it to the appropriate scientific bodies as well. And so, Mahima, uh, what are you doing to get that data on the efficacy of this drug against Omicron? Because that's what worries us now and it's our variants as well. So I think all companies have been trying to, you know, test their vaccines to look at how does it perform against Omicron. The key is if you have clinical sera samples available from your early trials, uh, then you can perform the neutralization assays, which really in, um, in kind of my layman terms is a simplistic, the simplistic way to explain it is to show uh, how much uh, protection or cross protection you will get or how much ability does your have, vaccine have to neutralize against the virus. So we use neutralization assays as a good correlate to show um, how much coverage there is. So companies are in the process of doing this. Um, everybody anticipates there will be a drop in protection, but if the protection level still remains high, I think we would uh, we would still have sufficient coverage what we do know and what the scientific community seems to converge on is the higher the antibodies, the better chances of uh, preventing severe disease, preventing hospitalization. We've seen this across the world. So sure. the key is, are we conferring sufficiently high antibodies? Um, and that should translate to a lower, uh, lower incidence of serious events. So therefore... Uh, again, it, it is a question of time because this statistic is important, you know, particularly when so many companies say we offer 90%, we offer 80% effectiveness. Um, are you looking for a statistically robust number uh, before you can actually come out with data which suggests that, look, we are X percent efficacious against Omicron? I'm not sure uh, that's very practical to do. You know, um, I was saying earlier in the day, when you even think about efficacy, all of the uh, vaccines were licensed based on efficacy against the original ancestral right. strain. Right. We all know that efficacy didn't translate to the exact same efficacy. There was a change. 
uh, when it came even to the Delta, we know there will be a change when it comes to Omicron. So I think we cannot define efficacy in classic terms like that anymore. Uh, and the second, uh, the second fact is that by the time we try to determine this statistically, we're already seeing other variants emerge. So we're not sure how relevant it will be to kind of go after that. Um, I think it's important that we do kind of the quick analysis that we can around uh, neutralizing antibodies as best as we can with whatever information different companies have and publish that. Uh, knowing fully well that there won't be a statistical basis for it, but it'll still give us some insight. It'll give us a direction into um, into what the kind of protection levels look like. Which really brings me to my next question, peer reviews. That's so important, particularly in terms of international recognition. Where do you stand, Mahima, with peer reviews, for example, Lancet or, or other journals? Yeah, um, so I anticipated this because I'm hearing a lot of noise around this. So I did make this distinction, and I think it's important to recognize that there's two things, right? Is information publicly available? One. And then is information being presented, peer-reviewed, and published, which is second. So for the first one, I have to uh, really clarify to everybody out there that our information is available, the clinical data is available on our website. It's also part of the pack insert. In fact, this is a requirement that we upload all this information. So it's publicly available for everybody to, you know, process it, critique it, you know, appreciate it um, and so on. Uh, with respect to publication, we recently published our phase one, two data, uh, but it's taking us some time to ensure that the internal review process uh, takes place because we've had several partners engaged in the development of this program, including government institutes like TSHDI. We've had uh, Baylor College of Medicine, obviously. We've had, um, you know, uh, um, Dynavax, uh, a supplier sure. of the key adjuvants, and we want to make sure it's reviewed by them. So, you know, I, I think in, within the next week to 10 days, our pivotal information will be published and following that the pediatric simply because this data came one, two months apart. Where but, would it be published most likely? So we're making it available on an open database because right. for actual the Lancets of the world to review it and then take it up for publication, they have their own internal process. And as you can imagine, they are inundated with publications, um, both related to developments in the mRNA space, tools that we're learning new information on a daily basis. So we can't anticipate what those timelines will be, but once we put it on that open publication database, then you know it follows uh, its, its process. But I do want to clarify our pivotal study that was that where we did a head-to-head -head comparison against Covishield is, pub is made public, it's available on our website, and all that information is also in our back insert. Okay. Um what about World Health Organization clearance, Mahima? Because, uh, for example, uh, as we've seen in the past, people traveling from country to country, they are, are still considered in many cases unvaccinated if it's not recognized by the EU regulator or the World Health Organization. And the WHO, let's face it, takes a whole lot of time uh, to, uh, to you know, work through things. So uh, have, you, have you approached them? Yes, we have approached them. And one of the prerequisites for them accepting the application is that you receive license in the country uh, that you first register, which we only did in December. So shortly after that, we confirmed our intent, uh, but WHO was aware of the developments. Uh, so they are currently reviewing our application, number one. But I also have to say that, you know, we've had a lot of experience. We have seven pre-qualified vaccines. Um, and yes, in some cases, um, it, it took longer than others. Uh, but by and large, we've had a very positive experience with WHO in terms of reviewing our data. Um, and so much so that we had a pre-qualification, um, you know, just post-COVID as well, as, which goes to speak that, you know, they really take these uh, very seriously. And I think they're committed to making sure that they can help in whatever way they can to make vaccines much more accessible, particularly in other parts of the world. Uh, Mahima, uh, you know, there's an article which has appeared uh, in The Wire which, which suggests that the National Technical Advisory Group, or NTAGI, 
uh, didn't necessarily clear this vaccine. It may have been cleared by other bodies, and they're quoting Dr. Jayaprakash Mulyal. Uh, what, what's the, what is the clarity on this? Yeah, I really haven't spoken to him personally, but I can confirm that we have shared our data with Entagi every step of the way. So usually the process is that our first uh, point of call or, you know, um, the first people we share data with is obviously the drug controller who convenes a, spe a special group of experts to review data. And it's not just to review data, to even provide input on protocols even before we conduct clinical studies. Uh, so we receive an approval for that. And then post conducting, they review the data before they confer approval. So our practice has always been that we receive approval and then we approach Entagi and present data, uh, which we consistently did throughout this process. On some occasions, we were solicited by Entagi to present data, even if it was you know, part of the trials because they want to just be kept informed. Um, so I'm at a loss to see where this was coming from, but I can confirm that Intagi has consistently reviewed uh, reviewed our data. Um, the late, yeah. So I would. And, and I they've would cleared the data. And they've cleared the data. Uh, I'm not aware of a formal process of clearance because that's an internal process which they recommend to the government, but the only formal process of clearance uh, for a manufacturer is the license that they receive. And subsequently, it's policy advice that's given, which is really an intra-government uh, discussion. Just one or two more questions, Mahima. Um, firstly, what is your belief as far as boosters are concerned? Now, we know the policy of the government thus far for people, you know, above uh, 45 to 60, there is no booster policy presently. Um, I ask this because I'm wondering if Corbevax for adults and for others can be that mix and match drug uh, which may prove to be efficacious going forward. Yeah, so a couple of things on the broader side, I think, um, you know, everybody recognizes that there is a need for boosters. Uh, last week, WHO gave a formal recommendation uh, that a booster must be given. This just came in last week. Um, and I think you know, initially the concern or the trepidation was, you know, if there was a wide booster um, kind of recommendation, uh, then the inequity that was being created with vaccines not being available to a large part of the world will only become much more acute. So I think there was, you know, that kind of reluctance that, you know, the vulnerable uh, are protected uh, first, and then we can think of boosters. I think the second thing is we also know that for certain vaccines or across vaccines, there's a different varying degree of, um, you know, reduction in waning of antibodies over time. Uh, so it's really important to assess, you know, what is that rate of a decline of antibodies um, and based on that data, make a recommendation for booster. That's what all countries are doing. Of course, countries with unlimited resources um, have taken a call that they will just go ahead and, and give a booster to make sure, um, you know, they're not waiting to make any trade-offs, right? Sure. Um, and the third thing we know is the higher the level of antibodies, the greater your chances of preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I'm, I think the government's actively considering it, and based on the data that becomes available to them, um, they will uh, take a call. What I can tell you is from our end, we received permission to do a booster study, which is really to test on a heterologous basis uh, to look at this mix and match, as you alluded to. We have all the data for the safety component, which we intend to submit. That's your first criteria when you're mixing and matching that first that it's safe. Uh, I can tell you it's extremely safe, but I would, you know, again, defer to the authorities to review the data. And as in when the immunogenicity data becomes available, we'll be sharing that too. A final question, you know, your own growth within this company, which was established in what, 1953, you took over from your father. Uh, you are one of India's most prominent uh, women business leaders and you have driven this company uh, with so many products now and hard science. Um, you know, you are an inspiration to so many women and, and men across the country looking to establish themselves as business leaders. Could you share some of your own thoughts or your vision on how you can actually rise and prove yourself successful 
despite the challenges which uh, you know which which you have had to face how much time do we have <laughs> as much time I, as you want <laughs> so no, i mean thank you so much i'm very humbled by your kind words you know um it hasn't been an easy journey i wouldn't even say it's been a journey that's happened uh, uh, by design it's really by default and you know i was very fortunate to um, grow to love uh, and become extremely passionate about what we do uh, so it makes the challenging days easier because you know it's great when you when you love what you do um the vaccine bit is is a particularly challenging one to choose you know i i was um, i guess born into it um, but it's it's a very difficult one to choose for a variety of reasons uh, forget about the product development uh, you know complexity around r and d investments the fixed cost infrastructure then you also have unpredictability on the buying side i mean mm. forget pandemic vaccines but even pediatric vaccines are bought by large institutional customers like unicef or by country governments for instance us and these are by they are tender procurement they can be binary in nature so it's not without its challenges but it's it's hugely rewarding it's hugely satisfying how many people can say that in my lifetime you know the little work i did contributed in its way um, directly to save lives so i think um the people we surround ourselves with continue to inspire us you know my team inspires me personally um and to be honest i'm the face of the company but our team does the heavy lifting they make me you know uh, look good and make it seem so simple but we have a world class team from literally global expertise committed themselves so much uh, to the company's vision so i think that's what uh, uh, made us get to where we are all right mahima datta thank you very much for speaking to us congratulations a huge day for for india vaccines for 12 to 14 year olds up to the age of 15 rolled out in india one of the few countries in the world where this is happening let's hope it works out well thanks very much indeed thank you so much